Good morning, everyone. You can say hi to the crowd. Um, not really big crowd today, but nice to have you with us on this November 26th, the Sunday after Thanksgiving. Um, we're continuing our Bible study on John's Gospel, and we are going to be in chapter uh, 20, verse 19, uh, some of the account of events of Jesus' resurrection. But before we do that, our opening prayer will be from the Psalter book, Psalm number 130, and uh, it's page 701 in the front of the Psalter. And while you look at that, before we read it uh, responsibly, I'll just share the uh, words in italics, the introduction at the bottom of the page. The church sings Psalm 130 in services that emphasize repentance and forgiveness through faith in Jesus. It is the 11th of the 15 Psalms of Ascents, Psalms 120 to 134, and sixth of the seven penitential psalms. Uh, Martin Luther said Psalm 130 is a prayer psalm. Uh, the psalmist confesses that no one is righteous before God and that no one can become righteous by their own works and righteousness. People can only become righteous through the grace and forgiveness of sins, which God has promised. The psalmist prophesies Christ in verse 8, and the entire psalm is based on this promise. So I'll read the first line, and y'all can respond with the indented line or letters. And we go through the psalm. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness so that we can with reverence serve you. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits. In his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord, more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. And we'll pray. God, our Father, you are rich in mercy, and there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Do not remember our sins, but blot them out for the sake of Jesus, who has redeemed us by his precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. Lead us to put our hope in you, for with you is unfailing love. Amen. Thank you for sharing in that prayer with me. Um, that focus you caught on the forgiveness of sins is a highlight of uh, Jesus seeing his disciples on the first evening, first Easter evening, as he forgives the sins of his disciples and empowers them to forgive others. <clears throat> So John chapter 20, obviously we are in the resurrection. We are still on Easter day. He has appeared to Mary Magdalene and the other women. Um, the disciples are behind locked doors. And I think we read verses 19 through 23, two weeks in a row, because there was so much in it, but we still didn't cover it all. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and read behind locked doors, verses 19 through 23 again, uh, but then especially focus on Jesus, uh, giving us the ministry or the use of the keys. Uh, someone volunteer to read that uh, those two paragraphs, verses Sam 19 through 23. On the evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were together behind locked doors because of their fear of the Jews. Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. Just as the Father has sent me, I am also sending you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whoever, whenever you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. Whenever you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So we spoke about it three weeks ago and probably four weeks ago, but so I'll make it an easy question to ask you again. Um, why were they behind locked doors? It's the question in the notes. Fear the Jews. Fear the Jews, and that's actually exactly what uh, what the uh, 
text says, right? For fear of the Jews. So then why were they afraid of the Jews? Or they did the Jesus. Okay. But with the report of, from the women, why were they still afraid of the Jews? Because they had taken him. Because they had taken him. They had crucified him. They had killed him. But then the report, what was the report of the women? He had risen. He had risen. So then they killed Jesus, but Jesus is alive. Why were they still afraid of the Jews? They didn't believe it. <laughs> unbelief. They didn't believe the message. They didn't believe the report yet. And Jesus doesn't leave them in unbelief. He comes and says, peace be with you. Does anybody know what the Hebrew is or the Aramaic is of that phrase, peace be with you? Shalom. Shalom. Shalom Aleichem. Okay. And so a typical greeting, even today, you'll hear that in, in the Islamic uh, Arab community because it's the same, uh, the same statement. Okay. Um, Shalom Aleichem. Um, and uh, peace be with you. But it wasn't the normal greeting when Jesus said it, right? The risen Lord actually sharing that message of peace who actually powerfully gave gave the peace that that uh that he speaks of um so and then receive the holy spirit um the word pneuma the greek word for spirit uh, can actually be spirit or breath or wind uh and so that's a kind of a, a neat thing where we know um, when he's talking about the holy spirit he's not talking about the holy breath so this is the Holy Spirit. This is the, the, the member of, of the triune God, the, the Holy Trinity. And the forgiveness of sins given in verse 23. Um, do you have any questions for me about that quick review before I get to the question, additional question and notes? Any comments or questions? Yeah, Mark? One thing that always, uh, I guess, I'm more of a visual type person, but he breathed on them. What, what is the significance of that? Okay. Did he breathe on them the first time? I guess not. No. Okay. So that's a good, good question. He didn't, peace be with you, right? I'm sending you. Um, so he's teaching them. He's giving a visual illustration and maybe even a felt illustration. I had a professor in high school that we uh, we didn't sit in the front row because he talked with a little bit of a lisp, and every now and then a little bit of spittle came flying out. So we had a little bit of we would hold up our note pages and a spit shield. We would anyway. We didn't sit in the front row if we could avoid it. Um, that's not what you know Jesus is talking about here. Receive the Holy Spirit that visual um, or actually felt, and from what the comment I made about the word spirit. Can you see how maybe that uh, that action of breathing on them helped in the understanding? The same word for spirit is breath or wind. So as Jesus breathes on them, it's not just uh, blowing to cool off. He's saying, you know, "I'm giving you the Holy Spirit, right?" Um, so and that spirit of the spiritual life. Um, to me, it also has a remembrance of uh, creation. What did God do to the dust? Breathe. Breathe. And what, what came about when he breathed into the dust? A living soul. Yeah, Adam had his living soul. When Jesus breathes on these disciples who were in unbelief, right? It is kind of connected to it. What happens to their unbelief? They're being dead to God made alive they believe that's the work of the holy spirit uh that life-giving spiritual breath so um kind of, maybe it, it, the connection i hope it's pretty obvious and simple and yeah that's that's as far as we need to take it because that is that, that teaching teaching mechanism and the next statement the ministry of the keys um lets us recognize we can breathe on other people too okay what do I mean? Uh, before, so I'll let that hang for just a moment while Dave asks his question or comment. Uh, later, they received the ability to speak in tongues, and that was accompanied by a great wind. Any similarity or connection? Is there a connection between the wind and the coming of the Holy Spirit 
and the breathing of Jesus and the coming of the Holy Spirit. You can nod your heads or say yes, right? But uh, here on, on this day, the with the you know in that small group, um, those disciples, it was for them. On Pentecost, why wasn't there just a people breathing on each other? Why was there the big wind going? Think about the numbers scale. A dozen or so plus with some women in that room, right? On uh, on Easter Sunday, how many people came to faith on Pentecost? 3,000, right? 3,000. And so the number scale, that, that blowing of the wind, um, on that great wind and the tongues of fire, drew attention to the disciples whose message then was the message the Holy Spirit used to bring, bring people to faith on Pentecost. So yeah, a good connection. Anything else there? Okay. So verse 23 Whenever you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. Whenever you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Question in the notes. What is the ministry of the keys? You say, Pastor, ask me something about the verse you just read. Why are you asking me about the ministry of the keys? That is the ministry of the keys. Oh, why do you say that's the ministry of the keys? Uh, because it is. <laughs> That's what we learned. Excellent answer. That's what we learned in catechism. What? When did we learn it in catechism, or what section of catechism class? I didn't print that out for you. What is the use of the keys? It's not. not it's, it, it's actually. It's the art. The articles of the the Apostles' Creed is one of the chief parts. There are six chief parts. Depending on how you number them, uh, the use of the keys can either be, it's usually put between baptism and Holy Communion, so it's oftentimes number five. So when this little booklet I put together, the catechism, it is the fifth chief part, the use of the keys or the ministry of the keys, and you can read it with me. Uh, first, what is the use of the keys? The use of the keys is that special power and right which Christ gave to his church to on earth to forgive the sins of penitent sinners, but to refuse forgiveness to the impenitent as long as they do not repent. And our star student, student will get to answer, where is this written? Can you read that? <coughs> is that the part enough for you? No, it's not. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you get out of it, even though you're a star student. It is the ministry of the keys because where is this written? Read with me. The holy evangelist John writes in chapter 20, Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Good Lutheran question. All right, so what does this mean? Actually, when, when he summarized the use of the keys, it's pretty simple and basic and straightforward. So when you, what does this mean? It's almost like, can I just tell you what I just read, right? <laughs> but anybody want to put it in your own words or explain just what is this use of the keys? Because in the explanation, we don't even have the, we, other than the use of the keys, we don't have any reference to a key. But Vasily, go ahead. It opens and closes the door to heaven. Yeah. And how do how do we do that? Open or close the door to heaven? By forgiveness or not. Forgiving, forgiving or not forgiving. So then that is that great power or the 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 uh, uh, the use of the keys. Uh, I remember in the catechism translation I grew up with, the word special power was translated peculiar. Uh, and um, the middle schoolers hearing that peculiar power, we kind of laughed at that. Peculiar was odd, strange, weird, right? But it really is a special thing. But it, and it is, it is, it is peculiar in that special way, right? Um, not not in a weird way. It's a special and amazing thing. Um, but we'll use it publicly in a Christian congregation. Unless you have any questions or comments to delve into, just what is the use of the keys? All right, the public use of the keys is second. 
Um, how does a Christian congregation use the keys? And let me get it to the right spot. And if, oh, you know what I need to do here? This might make it a little better. We're going to zoom in a little bit more. So it's already at 200. It was a pretty small print. So it's going up. See what happens with 250. Does that help a little bit? Okay. Second. Uh, so let's read the answer to how does a Christian congregation use the keys? A Christian congregation with its called servant of Christ uses the keys in accordance with Christ's command by forgiving those who repent of their sin and are willing to amend and excluding from the congregation those who are plainly impenitent that they may repent. I believe that when this is done, it is as valid and certain in heaven also as if Christ, our dear Lord, dealt with us himself. And Jesus had said something similar in Matthew 18, right? Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Um, so, but, but what, is this, what does this mean, this Christian congregation using the keys publicly? Any thoughts on putting that in your, that's, a, that's a six lines rather than three or four. And how does that apply to what Jesus just told his disciples? The same. The same. Tell what the same thing is then. The open and close the doors of heaven. Yeah, and then this kind of explains a little bit more. To whom do we open heaven? Those who are penitent, those who have heard the law and been cut to the heart and say, I've done something wrong. I need forgiveness. I need God. To whom do we lock heaven? Impenitent. impenitent. What does that mean, that word impenitent? Someone who has heard God's word and says, I don't need to change. Ken? That's right. The same thing? Yeah. Uh, is there someone else who has given an answer similar, a little different? Yeah, um, impenitent, they, they refuse to heed God's word. They, they don't think there's anything wrong. They don't need God. They don't need forgiveness. Um, I'm gonna, or they, they might recognize it's wrong, but say, even though it's wrong, I'm gonna continue to do it, right? Uh, then they don't need heaven unlocked. What do they need? They need that counsel from God's law to continue. Carol. But it, it also is not permanent. This isn't a permanent shunning. If that person, if that person under, comes to understanding their sin and does ultimately repent, comes back, there is a way for them back into the church. Yeah, what is that way back into the church? Repentance. Repentance, but they also they also may need to go through instruction, the wonderful um instruction class again because there they will learn more about forgiveness right more yep. about what they what they did and what yep. they haven't done but it's not i know years and years ago in our congregation up in wisconsin um there was a time when council did literally they did this to one woman and she ended up um coming back yeah it's a serious statement to say uh uh, you yeah, know, plainly impenitent, and you and you are outside of the church. Your, your sins are not forgiven. And, and Jesus, uh, Matthew 18 goes into more of those details, and which is why it's nice and cited here, but not in its entirety. Right? Treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Right? Someone who is cut off. Someone who is uh, who is by their way of life living living apart from God. You, know, you don't you don't treat them like everything's okay. You still love them, but your love is going to be somehow included in with uh, with letting them know what they're doing is wrong, letting them know that that uh, they're on the outs with God and me. Uh, 
Um, so yeah, the, to continue that uh, that Christian counsel in a loving way until eventually Matthew 18 will say, well, you're locking heaven. There may be a time when you have to walk away from the key and stop trying to give them the key to open it and say, yeah, I need to go on and move on to somebody else who might listen to me. Um, and then hopefully, I mean, that's, even then you don't need to stop praying for them. You can still pray that someone else reaches their life or pray that one last time, God, I have to stop trying. They're not listening to me. Please send someone else into their life so they'll listen and repent. Yeah, and, and the connection to the visible church um, you know, might include uh, going to Bible basics class again, sitting down with the elders and, and the, or the pastor or maybe the elders too, if it was a public thing, and uh, not necessarily a public in front of the whole church, I was wrong. You may want, someone may want to do that. Um, but those steps joining the visible church for the ministry of the keys um, aren't necessarily needed to be in the invisible church, right? Who, who brings him into the invisible church when he knows the heart? The Holy Spirit, God, God does that. So he knows when a person repents and believes in Jesus and it can be uh, at the 11th hour on their deathbed and there may not even be a pastor there to hear the person say, God, I'm sorry for all I've done wrong. I believe Jesus forgives me. Please take me to heaven. Maybe there's a pastor who's not there to hear it. Nobody hears it. But God knows that person in the, in the books won't ever be a funeral for the Christian church, right? But they're in heaven with God. The wonderful blessing is if that a family member who's a Christian or a friend who's a Christian or a pastor who's a Christian hears that, they can actually say, yes, you are forgiven. The door may have been locked for you for a long time, but now it's unlocked. So, and questions or comments as you dig into that more. And which of you, you can, you don't have to raise your hand, but you can mentally raise your hand or do it if you have someone you know who's important to you, to whom the door is unlocked, is locked right now. Yeah. If you do, yeah, and then, then we know, okay, we, 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 Jesus gives us this power for them, right? Not to make us sad, it's locked, but to say, you know what? They're still alive. There's still something I can do. I'll do it. Yeah. Please. When the congregation finally has to do that, it is such a difficult step for the members to take. It weighs on them, but that's what God wants for the church, that they will call true repentance to this action being taken. Yeah. And uh, and if it's weighing, I mean, if there is a, a vote for, uh, you know, excommunication, I, I would usually say, well, if you're going to tell it to the whole church, don't, you might bring it up uh, at one voters meeting that this person is, uh, uh, you know, is, is unrepentant. Um, I say, you know what? Unless everybody who's attending that meeting of the congregation has already tried individually to speak to that person, don't follow through on the vote. You table it until three months or half a year from that so that everybody who's there if it weighs on their heart they will go to that person and say we don't want to do this but it appears you're living from our vantage point you are living unre unrepentant and outside of god's love come back so that you don't make that vote until everybody has had that weigh on their heart and and act and that's why you tell it to the church not just to not just to ruin their name. Please. In that sense, the act of communication by the church is closing the door. Mm -hmm. But that door is temporary because we're going to pray and pray and pray that they will repent. Yep. The final closing comes on judgment day when the Lord judges. Yeah, final judgment comes on closing. You know, judgment day, the door is temporarily closed. And I, and I like the way you said that and explained it. And the, the word came to my mind, time of grace, right? The church doesn't end a person time, person's time of grace by excommunication. Person's time of grace ends when they die. Yeah. 
Any thoughts or additional comments on, on this? And again, uh, not to make us sad as we think about those individuals, but maybe to, to spur us on. So I've got some, that's a way to try to communicate. Okay, back to, back to John chapter 20, and we're gonna see that uh, the disciples actually, to some degree or another, had to put this into practice a bit with, with one of the 12. So we, um, yeah, we through verse 23, as we're back here on the screen, um, it's kind of small again, and since it helped you to make it bigger, we're gonna do that again. I know you have it in front of you, but let's see if that works here. We'll zoom in a little bit more. Just a little bit bigger there. Okay, so we have Thomas finally believes, continue with verse 24. Um, someone, and let's read that whole section. Again, if there's a, another star student who wants to read verse 24 all the way through 29. You don't have to be a star student to read. <clears throat> Volunteer to read that? Yes, Ron. <coughs> Then Thomas, one of the twelve, the one called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples kept telling him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger into the mark of the nails, I will, and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. After eight days, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Take your hand and put it into my side. Do not continue to doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So as we read that, any comments or questions that you have for me before we dig into it as a group a little bit, anything stand out for you at your initial read? Okay, taking it apart bit by bit, Thomas was one of the 12, right? He is one of the 12, even, even then, and, and when he's, uh, when he's, uh, when he hadn't been with them. And when I see uh, the disciples say, we've seen the Lord. They say it the first time when Thomas comes back. Uh, a word highlighted, you know, I'll highlight right here. Kept telling him, right? Uh, this takes me back to the thought of the, the ministry of the keys. Uh, they hadn't locked the door to heaven. They hadn't refused to forgive Thomas his sins. But we have the repetition of, God's love and forgiveness. So I want to tell you, let you know, you know they kept, kept it up. Think of that uh, uh, seven days, eight days of saying, we've seen the Lord. And Thomas, uh, how quickly he says this, uh, this statement, I, I, don't, yeah, I don't want just, uh, you know, it could have been a phantom, a ghost, an imaginary appearance. Um, I'm not going to go for that. What does he demand? Proof. Proof, not just fee, right? Not, not even just seeing. Uh, you know, he wants to see, but seeing's not enough. Even seeing could be a ghost, a phantom, at least in theory. It says, I want to want to touch. Right? Nail marks, seeing in his hand, then my fingers got to touch his side. Those telltale uh, marks of, of him dying, that he's not any imposter. Again. Pretty, pretty adamant statement. Um, we call him Doubting Thomas. You think that's a good way to refer to Thomas? No. So some people say, why do you, why do you think it's a good? He's called the, the Thomas. Some people might even call him the Doubter. Some of you nodded your head. Anybody want to say why you were comfortable with that nickname for Thomas? Mark? Well, um, he had all the proof in front of him, but he still had questions. 
Yeah, he's still had questions. He wasn't satisfied with the question or the answers that the people around him, he wanted to make sure that that was the true Jesus. Yeah, he wanted to make sure, right? And, um, and so we could call it doubt, nothing really wrong with calling him doubting Thomas. But for eight days, if you look at the final thing he staged, those last four words of verse 25, those last five thing, uh, four words he states, for eight days, he really wasn't doubting Thomas. What was he? Unbelieving, unbelieving Thomas. This is unbelief, not just doubt. Um, so, uh, so he actually comes out and, and says that. Um, and, but even there, an unbelief, Jesus doesn't just lock heaven and leave, right? Um, Thomas is still with the disciples and they're probably saying, yeah, we did see Jesus. Maybe they continue that conversation, but Jesus uh, comes to them. We still have, you know, I know for 2000 years, we, we don't, we don't have, we don't have the proof per se, other than the truth that we believe in, but there's still denominations out there that, that rely on relics and things like that to prove to prove to them that this happened. And that's what drives me a little crazy. Yep, yeah, they're, they're still, I mean, it is a natural human human thing because we are, we are physical human beings. We're used to experience and touching that we see what we believe. We, we have to touch it to, to believe it. And they're, they're using science to do this, and, and that's not always, you know, the right thing to do. Yeah, science can be a proof, and, and ultimately we're not going to be able to Prove it more than what we get at the final statements. Can you open the doors? You got a little ahead of us, but in verse 29, Jesus said, Thomas believed because he saw. Uh, who's the last person to saw Jesus? Uh, the Apostle Paul, right? After his ascension, still saw Jesus. But since then, people haven't seen Jesus for that proof. So what is the blessing still today or ever for 2,000 years of Christianity? not seen and yet believed. Yeah. And so, um, so anytime a, a church wants to make it easier to believe by giving them something to see, they're erasing this verse. I'm going to give you a relic. I'm going to give you an appearance of an image. I'm going to give you a vision. I'm going to give you something you can know for sure that, that this is true about Jesus. Um, Jesus said, no, see, believe without seeing is where you are the last. So this is Martin Luther had the same yeah. issue too with the uh, with the uh, yeah. church of, of having relics to <laughs> right to to really recognize this forgiveness um, is given many different ways and God does use touching and 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 things to communicate forgiveness. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Communion. Communion. Right in worship today, you, you you taste and smell and chew and bite. You feel it, and, and the water on the head. You hear it over the baby. You feel it if if you're the child or the adult being baptized. Uh, God does connect our, but by that special way of forgiveness, it is that that holy sacrament using those elements connected to the Word of God, where the Word of God is the power. Yeah, so that that's that special special blessing that God gives to it. All right. Again, a peace be with you. Jesus' first words, the second Sunday, the second Sunday evening, right? Not just to wish for peace, he actually gives it. Um, and I look back at that uh, verse 26 again, with the peace be with you, and the doors were locked. And, and do you think Jesus just came for Thomas? Why are you ch you're shaking your heads? You mean do you agree with me? Why are you shaking your heads? Came for the world. <laughs> Why did he have to come for the others? They already saw him. Came for us. The doors were locked. <laughs> Seven or eight days later, you know, this is a week later, the way of saying a week. The doors were locked again. Oh, come on, guys. Don't be afraid of the Jews. The risen Lord. Okay. But um, Thomas's unbelief or doubt, because we doubt, and maybe we even might say, God, I'm, I'm not going to believe. Might even drop into that low point because of some difficulty we're facing. Right? We have the second appearance of Jesus for our benefit as well, right? 
So yeah, not just for Thomas, not just for the other disciples. We have this for us as well. But to see that that God's love and and uh, put your Jesus actually comes to his disciple and says, yeah, I'm going to give you what you requested. Do not continue to doubt what believe. So yeah, Jesus used that word doubt. Um, but uh, and I should have I should have looked up the Greek already. But that came to my mind here in verse verse 27. Yes, but that yeah, do not continue uh, to doubt but believe. Uh, yeah, the the Greek is the the word do not continue in unbelief. It is the negative. Uh, pistos is the Greek word for faith. Ah, pistos is the Greek word for unbelief. And ah, pistos is used. Jesus says Thomas's current condition was, and then but his thoughts, but believe. Um, questions through that statement of Jesus. Then we get to Thomas, right? Finally, you don't know what that means. The 20 fell to the slot. That's what happens with the telephone, right? Everybody know what a payphone was? You put a dime in, right? Sometimes it went through, it came out and changed, right? When it falls, it, it falls in, okay, the call goes through. Um, that, that's the Spanish way to say it. You realized it, right? The, the light came on, the light of faith here. So, yeah, my Lord and my God. Uh, evaluate that confession. You can't hold all this side. All doubt was gone. Look at my note. Uh, why do I refer back to John 1.1? 1, 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word yes. was God. Right? So yeah, so here, we're nearing the end of John, we get back to the beginning of John. John's coming in a circle. This is a statement of who, Je who Jesus is, and Thomas gets to help us close out that circle. Yes, Jesus is God. Anything else? Any other thoughts on the, on that confession? Um, what's the difference between calling? Uh, why both? Then you can maybe you'll know the difference. But God, right? The the Creator, the Supreme Being, Lord. Why say both? Are they identical? Yeah, Lord is God. But why Lord and God? Why not just Jesus, you're my God. Why? Or Jesus, you're my Lord. Why? My Lord and God. Anybody ever thought of that? It's Lord, your Savior, and God, Lord, your Creator. Okay, Lord, Savior, God, Creator. Um, um, that, that, not, not wrong with thinking about it that way. That's, that's a decent way to do it. Um, uh, anybody else before we? Well, I think that there's different, uh, different groups that have different definitions of what they call God and the Lord, you know, uh, because of our language. I think that's really what it is. It, it means the same thing, but you know, two different groups would, would mean call the Lord, call it God, call it our Savior. Um, yeah, the, the different phrases of re refer to different aspects, and yes. right, some people might say a false God is God, a false God is Lord, a false Savior is there. So when Thomas is saying this, obviously speaking to Jesus, he has the right Savior, the right Lord, the right God. Um, but if you want to just kind of differentiate God, that supreme being, that's the concept there of God. And Thomas is saying, you're my God. I recognize you as my creator, my supreme being. Lord, what's the concept there? And you think about even the English word Lord and who are the lords of old? In the in the head, yeah, right? Or a master, yeah. right? Kind of that concept of the master, and that's a little bit more personal. I'm following your directions. You're in charge of me. You're you're also providing for me if you're my lord, right? So so it's a little bit. You can say, yeah, you are my master and my supreme being. We think yeah, it, it's interchangeable when Jesus is both, right? But there's a little nuance of what those words mean. So you can. You can Anybody want to add anything on that? Because that's kind of how I think of, you know, just describing those common words, Lord and God. 
Um, and we talked about 29 already. Yeah, Thomas believed because he saw. Um, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Uh, so we talked, spoke about it a little bit, but the comment in the, in the notes, so what things do we believe without seeing? I guess that's a question, not a comment. We do want to share some of the things or things we believe without seeing. We believe in the resurrection. The resurrection of the dead, Jesus' resurrection. Yeah. The wind. You believe believe the wind is there without seeing it yeah, because you feel it, right? Um, but gee, obviously we're talking here about what's found in the, Bible. in the Bible. And do we really, have we seen all of these events? They're just words on a page. They're not just words on a page, right? Um, we God, we read them and we believe, and that blessing doesn't come because we've got that little bit of ability to, yeah, I'm going to believe of my own authority. Here, the third article of the Apostles' Creed comes to mind, right? How do I believe? I cannot, by my own thinking or choosing or reason or strength, right? Believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. Holy Ghost, to that yeah, Holy Spirit uh, has called me by the gospel. And any comments or questions more about uh, what does that word blessed mean? Blessed. Blessed are those who have not seen yet have believed. Simplest way that I see the word blessed, happy. Yeah, and not, not in the fickle happiness of, of a party or, or you are happy, you're in a good situation. And then, uh, coming up on the end of it, but uh, verses 30 and 31, I volunteer to quickly read that for us. Did they? Jesus, in the presence of his disciples, did many other miraculous signs that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So the miraculous signs is actually just one word in the Greek. Signs. Jesus didn't, uh, uh, didn't call them, or John did not call them miracles, um, which is that amazement word. There's a Greek word for that amazement. Here he's referring to a sign. There was a purpose for all of those miracles he did um, to give a sign to point to who Jesus was. And, and John's in the, yeah, there, there are more, and not just the ones recorded in the four Gospels, uh, but I'm giving you what God has given me to write so that, verse 31, why was John's Gospel written? Why was God's Word written? You may believe, but then the first person, so that I will believe, so we would believe, um, and that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's a good, good summary. Anybody want to put that central message of the Bible in your own words? Then make verse 31 your own words by memorizing it. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Please. Well, it says Jesus is Christ, the Son of God. Again, we've got a statement there. Yeah. And stating it twice for us to remember. Yeah. I mean, who Jesus is, he's the Son of God, no different than my Lord and my God. Yeah, yeah. That, that, so it takes it back statement. to John 1. And, and it's not Jesus is the Lord, the Son of God. Why, why is Christ used here? What's Christ mean? Pay attention to the sermon today, because I'll say it again. Christ means the Messiah, the anointed one, the one who is anointed to be the Savior. And I think he used that word Savior again, too. And so that, that all is included in that word Christ. And so if you put this in your own words, when you talk to someone, right? I've got words that, that, that Jesus is the one who saves me from my sin. He's the true God, and there's life in him, right? You tell someone today Jesus is the Christ, they don't know a lot about the Bible. It's not going to have any meaning. But the one who removes my guilt and my sin, that, that's kind of putting it in your own words for, for today as you share the message. 
Uh, let's uh, close then, and we can have it next week. We can have any additional questions, dig into this a little bit more if you would like. But we'll close with prayer. God bless us with this central message of the Bible that we put our faith in, in the words and, uh, of the gospel, the truth of your love for us, which we have not seen, but your powerful spirit has brought us to believe it for our eternal life. In your name, we thank you. Amen. And we'll worship in about 13 minutes.